Thanks uh, very much, Fania, and for inviting me today. I'll start with an apology, actually. Firstly, uh, for parachuting in just in time for lunch. <laughs> no, not intentional. My first meeting was in Bristol. But also, I'm afraid I have to um, leave um, straight after my talk. Uh, not that I'm anti questions. after questions. Oh, yes. Not that I'm anticipating that negative reaction. <laughs> hopefully, that I have to escape. But um, this year is the 180th anniversary of the uh, School of Pharmacy, uh, now the UCL School of Pharmacy. And as one of the few people who were there from the start, um, I've got to give a public lecture. Uh, celebrating it. So I'm afraid I'll have to leave you. Um, so this is, I, I was invited um, to join the Inhale team by Vanya and Vicky. Um, in really, uh, what I consider to be an insightful move in terms of uh, their view that, you know, this is all about looking at the impact of technology on uh, medical uh, interventions but recognizing that actually there's often a rate limiting step between good technologies and good outcomes, and that's them strange folk called humans. So um, wanting to build in, if you like, to uh, latch on to the INHALE program, some behavioral studies that would look at clinician perspectives of the uh, biofire technology and whether that influenced their behavior. So we wanted to try and at you know, opportune points, understand prescribing as a behaviour, both before the trial started and then during the trial to look at views about prescribing antibiotics in intensive care and the use of molecular diagnostics in that respect. Um, so these were our aims, basically. I don't think I need to look through all three, of, uh, all of those. I've given you the top line. It's to understand the behavioural aspects. Now, why do we do that? It's because, you know, just having the technology or the knowledge, you know, if you give someone information, look, here's a better way of doing it. The interesting thing is that don't change practice very much. There is a gap between even the best and well thought out guidelines and practice in all areas of medicine. So we have an information action gap. Now, what's in that gap? Well, this is where you have the um, whole area of behavioral science, which I've spent 25 years researching. But it boils down to two things, really. There are two reasons why people don't do things they can't or they don't want to. Now, that startling insight um, is <laughs> the basis of my life's work, so don't laugh. So, but when, when you dig um, a, bit late, you know, a bit closer into this, what you see is that there are overlapping reasons for, if you like, non-adherence to the technology or the guidelines. If you look on the right-hand side, people often can't do it. It's unintentional. They want to um, do the right thing, but they can't because of barriers beyond their control, uh, lacking capability and resources, or environmental factors like cost restraints, just the way that the system works, um, make them less able to do it. These are the practicalities. But also overlapping with that in the same individual is the vexed issue of don't want to, motivation. And to understand, you know, there, there may be intentional reasons for not applying the guidelines or for using the new technology. And to understand our motivation, we need to look in a different place at our perceptions, our beliefs, Emotions, though obviously that's not a factor with clinicians, <laughs> heaven forbid. But and background biases that influence whether we think it's a good idea or not. In this case, to apply biofire and to prescribe according to the results. So, looking at that circle in a little bit more detail, we've uh, um, sort of applied a framework. You know, how can, we, how can we understand beliefs? People can believe the moon is made out of cheese. Where do you start? Is this trying to get clinicians to lie on the couch and tell us about their childhood? Of course not. It's the beliefs that will influence behavior. Um, I was shocked when Vanya invited me uh, to do this uh, study um, on the assumption that clinicians, of course, don't uh, have the same foibles as um, other humans, and that all of their decisions will be entirely evidence-based. 
Um, but anyway, we did the studies. This is our position. But we did the studies anyway, just in case uh, they resembled uh, humans. And this is a framework that most of my previous research has been done with patients and looking at non-adherence to treatment. And this is a framework that comes out of uh, very consistently in studies across the globe in lots of long-term conditions, understanding why people decide not to take uh, medicines. And there are two beliefs that are pivotal, necessity beliefs and concerns. A necessity belief is not the same as believing something is efficacious or beneficial. Rather, it's the answer to two questions that we ask ourselves. Firstly, how much do I really need to do this to achieve something that's important to me? And secondly, can I get away without doing it? And the reason we ask the second is that usually, once, even when a necessity belief is in place, we start to consider the downside. And although these beliefs are often in the background. We're not working it out on a piece of paper. Many of this, these processes are subconscious, but we're weighing up our need to do it against our concern about doing it, which may be about demonstrated evidence-based risks, but also other stuff. So we, want, we wanted to see if we could uh, use this framework to understand clinician behavior. And so, in our view, beliefs were going to be key. You know, we could profile clinicians according to all sorts of criteria like, you know, seniority, experience, background, etc. You could get two identical clinicians, but it's what's in their head about this issue that, of course, will be pivotal. And there are two examples there, you know, of different beliefs that might influence the impact of biofire. And... You, know, you have to get under the skin, if you like. So there were five studies, qualitative and quantitative. We looked at clinicians' antibiotic prescribing decisions in ICU prior to biofire. How do people make those decisions? Looking at patient, clinicians' beliefs about molecular diagnostics before implementation, and then looking at barriers and drivers to the implementation. And then a quantitative study, um, I mean, it was really... What was great about this study was that um, just as we were getting underway, um, a, a global pandemic happened, which was kind of convenient for me because it allowed us to put another study in, which was to look at perceptions with, uh, around antibiotics prescribing and biofile with and without COVID. So, you know, obviously hugely challenging time. How did the presence of COVID affect how clinicians were thinking about these issues. And then finally, we've got a study where we're analysing at the moment, which is called uh, an EMA study. And that's where you try and get as near to the prescribing event as possible. Um, uh, and this was interviewing clinicians on the day of the prescription, very short interviews uh, after their shift. Very difficult uh, to do, and we're incredibly grateful to the clinicians who gave us their time to do that. These are some top-level findings. First of all, understanding decisions about antibiotics uh, prior to um, the biofire. We did with focus groups and interviews where clinicians looked at scenarios and did think aloud, you know, told us about what they were thinking. And um, th this was the sample, so a, a mixed range of uh, prescribers. And we looked at necessity for prescribing and concerns. And what came out of this was actually that um, often the difficulty for clinicians um, and all people who are prescribers in the audience will recognize this, I'm sure, but um, that often the issue is competing necessity. So all the clinicians were very much aware and very engaged with the idea of um, antibiotic stewardship and avoiding antibiotic resistance. But the difficulty was that the more proximal necessity, in their view, was to protect the patient in front of them. And there was often a conflict between those two aims. So the way to protect the patient is to give maximal cover now, and that that overrides any concern about the dangers, because the, the harm from overusing antibiotics was considered to be at a societal level and in the future. So the more proximal threat was 
from the uh, harm to the patient of not prescribing. But also clinicians reported on events where they, in the past they had been burnt by not prescribing hard enough, wide enough, and early enough. And those events, although they would be the minority, the bias was to go to those as they were the ones that had greatest impact on that particular clinician in terms of, uh, well, all sorts of impact. So a very human decision to avoid those cases where they had uh, been burnt. What came out as less of a concern, actually, was the notion of broad-spectrum antibiotics being harmful to the patient. The harm was considered in terms of antibiotic stewardship. So context, uh, decisions were very, you know, um, context-related, uh, and it's that balance between doing right by the patient and protecting humanity, a very difficult uh, juxtaposition for the individual clinician. And molecular diagnostics were perceived in general very positively, and the idea was well received, but um, with some concerns about clinical implementation. I'll, I'll, I'll look at those uh, in more detail here. We don't have time to go into them, but for example, um, getting the, a, a suitable sample was perceived to be quite challenging, particularly in COVID. Um, the fact that a false positive result might um, result in overprescribing. That was from a microbiologist, surprisingly. And a false negative may give you the confidence to stop <laughs> therapy when actually the patient is still unwell. Um, and also, you know, the notion that um, clinicians, especially experienced ones, are often skeptical about new technology. Seen it, done it, got the T-shirt, and, you know, is it really as good as we think it is? Then we looked at the issue of um, attitudes with and without COVID. This was a quantitative survey in 63 clinicians across five UK hospitals. I'm just going to give you some top-line findings from this. And this shows this tension uh, around the perceived need to prescribe to protect the patient. You will see this is the percentage of people who agreed with the statement on the left-hand side, need to protect patients from secondary infection, overrides concerns about AMR almost a half. You have to prescribe broad and early as you can't trust getting the test results uh, on time during COVID. Um, a broad spectrum prescription is justified for most ICU patients with COVID-19. So you can see the range of perceptions there. Clinicians' concerns about early prescribing were there, but usually in, you know, not all of the sample, usually a half or less. Risk of AMR to BSAB means they should be used sparingly, 53%. The potential harmful effects of broad spectrum means we should use them sparingly, 42%. And I fear the consequences of not prescribing as a routine fail-safe, almost a third uh, had that view. And then when you look at these um, results, I don't think there's time to go through them in much detail, but what we found was it didn't really differ when um, we were asking patients about treating patients who don't have COVID-19 and those where they do have a positive test for COVID-19. And we found very similar findings across the board. I think reflecting on the real difficulties and nuances of, of treating patients that are extremely unwell, where the picture is often clinically diverse and not clear. And you see there's another set of results there. And the final EMEA study, these are just one-minute questionnaires within 24 hours of prescribing. We're analyzing this data. Here are some top-line early findings. One in four clinicians do not have confidence in guidelines. One in four uh, prescribing decisions are not consistent with the guideline recommendations. Um, and there was no difference across the, uh, the inhale arms there. One in five clinicians don't believe the molecular diagnostic test result. They don't have confidence in what the algorithm was recommending. And two in five prescribing decisions were not consistent with the algorithm recommendations. 
So I think the take-home um, messages are molecular diagnostics really do have potential, but it's complex. I think the Southampton study, Tristan's study, was fascinating in showing that people do, by and large, implement the findings, but there's still a gap at, you know, it's never 100%, maybe 20 30% might not. How can we support that? Some answered questions about the place of the tests in practice, but to get the best from them, we need to work closely with um, practicing prescribers to understand their perspectives more, if you like, to try and stand in their shoes and look at how we can not just put the technology in place but support it. Um, and the application of molecular diagnostics in ICE was complicated by clinical uncertainty and complexity. It's really like the art of medicine meets the, co the technological side of medicine and understanding that, isn't it? That's a challenge for us. Um, there's a trust between, um, you know, there's, there's an issue about clinician trust and the balance between clinical judgment and technological measurements that we're only just beginning to research and understand. But I do think that's uh, a fruitful area for future study. You know, the idea of clinicians as humans working within a very complex uh, set of variables. So uh, thanks very much. I think it's time for questions. Well, thank you. thank you very much, Rob. Um, as you can see, we can all now stick pins our, in our eyes and go home and give up entirely or not. But uh, uh, the point about Rob's talk, I think, really does relate to the reality of uh, the bit between the art and the science. Before he goes... Uh, uh, people might want to ask Rob some questions. And it's interesting, isn't it, when you see in hard numbers the number of people who didn't do what we asked them to do in the trial or who just didn't believe the result. Or were too scared is too easy a point. It, it did not have the confidence to act on the result and back off. Council, I was afraid that they didn't do what we asked to do. It yes. wasn't going to work out. Yeah. Did, yeah, yeah. So, stand by, yes. Yeah. Questions? Luke. Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, necessity versus concern, get that. We understand the problem. We are understanding the problem. What do we do about it? How do we uh, not adjust behaviour? That sounds very 1984, but how do we, how, how do we move forward from, from this foundation? So I think in, in general terms, you know, the purpose of studying these sort of belief barriers is that it has implications for how you present your information. And, you know, once you understand the clinician's perspective, I think it then leads to a different dialogue or a different set of recommendations which take account of that. So two, like, obvious examples, perhaps, are firstly recognising that there's a challenge Right? That they, you know, recognizing that what they're facing is how do I protect the individual patient? And also recognizing where there are concerns and perhaps even lack of trust in the biofire result and specifically addressing that. The second one is I think it may be useful to bring a little bit more to the fore the idea that using a broad spectrum antibiotic is not a risk free um, uh, prescription for that individual patient that you are trying to protect. So, so you know, the broad spe in the first study, the broad spectrum antibiotic uh, usage seemed to me to be all about protection, really, protecting the patient foremost, but also the clinician, you know, from any litigation or blame or, and that could be self-blame for getting, you know, the treatment for a very vulnerable patient wrong. And people die as a result. So, you know, you, it's very understandable, I think. But I think that's, that's kind of how you might use this information uh, to try to just have a better dialogue. You know, it's not about forcing the clinicians to do it in a particular way. Ultimately, it's their decision. They're the one with the responsibility. But framing the discussion and the um, information in a way that recognises their world I don't know if the way your studies were structured was allowed to see this, but did you see any effect of a, essentially a learning curve or a developing familiarity with the technology and the way clinicians can interact with it? I, now, that would be great if we could have done, and, and potentially you could look at that, um, because obviously the study and our interviews and things run over time, but we haven't got the power really 
or, or the sort of depth of insight to really be able to do that. Like a lot of our work is brief qualitative interviews because these are busy people stressed at the end of a shift. So um, I don't think we can really chart that. My hunch would be people become more positive as they experience it. Certainly, our, I think our experience in yeah. the yeah. 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 And like, as you get, as your environment shifts around the study, that has almost like a nudge effect of positivity. As I know, Martin uh, Newrek has, Martina Newrek has looked at in uh, Imperial. You know how the environment and, uh, and background biases and small changes can actually make you more positive uh, about a behaviour. So I would anticipate more engagement as it goes through. I think also some important role of peer group normalisation. Yeah. So, you know, as a group of clinicians, the only defence you have against an adverse event is your colleagues yeah. standing beside you saying, you know what, I'd have done the same thing. Yeah. And so when you're getting particularly things like withholding antibiotics and someone has a negative test, or rapidly de-escalating antibiotics, yeah. if the rest of your group of colleagues sit there and say, actually, Yes. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. And that's very true. And obviously, yeah. the nighttime prescription story is probably. If I if I could phone a friend or talk to my mates, I'd probably hang off. But I can't because I'm on my own. So groupthink, culture, the environment of your unit where people are starting to pick up on this technology may make all the difference. Absolutely. And the gap between the box plus the algorithm versus the box plus Tristan, mm. albeit, you know, that's, we need to dig into that further. Thank you very much. Thank you. That Thanks was great.